Welcome to another episode of the Unconventional Christian Podcast. I am your host, Ladoon Thompson, and today we have the amazing, the beautiful, the super, 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 <laughs> I can't even begin to explain how super of a woman um, Gia Peppers is. I'm so happy to have you on here today. Thank you for having me. I'm finally here, and I'm glad to be here in my swag. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so normally we always kick it off with a prayer. And since I do know, you know me, I'm always seeing your stories, taking your Bible scriptures. I know you are a woman of prayer. So um, I would love to have you lead us in prayer today. Sure. All right, let's go. Um, let's go to God in prayer in this moment. Lord, we just want to say thank you so much for waking us up for another day, for allowing us to get through the day to this point, and for allowing us to fellowship on the internet. Thank God for the internet as we go into this conversation. Lord, you are already here. You live within us. You live within every single person listening. You live within all of our family and our friends. And in this moment, Lord Jesus, we ask that you anoint this conversation. Let it be what the listeners need to hear. Let it be what we need to hear. Let it be what you want it to do all that you wanted to do in this kingdom. God, we thank you for the opportunities to be who we are. Help us to be more and more of who you called us to be and who you are calling us to be. Continue to surround us with people who know you, who love you, who represent you well, and continue to be the God, the I am that I am, all of the, all that we need. And we ask all these things and more. And thank you for all these things and more in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you. We needed that. I needed that. I needed okay. that prayer for today. We love a prayer. <laughs> we do love a prayer. Oh, man, I can't wait to. In fact, I, I got to bring you into the prayer room, which is something I do on Instagram. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, usually in the mornings. But um, wow. Um, yo, coming off a super high because you, you've had an amazing. Uh, you, yo, I've been, you know, watching you. It seems like it's like it's only going up. Mm. Up, up. Yeah, only up from here like you know i've seen it constant the constant rise um but you had an amazing last couple of weeks man like i'm i'm i mean your story i'm like let me look at what gia posted yeah and then you're not even posting everything till later because you were being so intentional yeah, like yeah. nah i get it um from met you were at the met you're the only person i know that has has actually been to the Met. <laughs> wow. How was that? How was that experience in itself? Yeah. Uh, so the Met Gala, you know, we all know is this storied, historic fashion event. It's iconic, but essentially, you know, it's all about creating funds for the Met to stay open, for fashion to thrive, and for Anna Wintour to have who she wants in the building to be in the building. And I didn't realize like the tables cost like $250,000. So, you know, I did not go inside the Met. I was covering the Met Gala yeah. on behalf of Essence. Um, and, you know, it was such an incredibly um, long day, but it was a beautiful day. Um, and it was, it, it happened so last minute. And that's how funny God is. Like literally two weeks before I was on my friend Sylvia O'Bell's couch in Los Angeles. And I was just talking about how I'm so sick of just the grind and like, I'm so over just like working, working, working and things not turning out in the way that I want them to. And the, my timeline not being what I want it to be. And you know, those moments where you just get fed up. And so I was just yeah. venting to my friend who also understands she's also a, a journalist on air talent. And I'm just like, yo, I'm just so sick of no. Like I've heard it so many times at this point. I am sick of the word. No, I am sick of things not going in the way that I hoped that they would go. And um, she was just like, girl, just come here. Let me give you a hug. Cause you now here we go again. Like this, be quiet now. You're fine. Like, and I'm like, no, I'm just ready to give up. I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm over it. And right. God and I have this really funny thing where like, and it's really me. It's not God. He's probably rolls his eyes at me every time I do it, but I will be like, Lord, all right, I'm giving up. I don't know what you, I think you, at this point, you like you 48 trying to be a rapper and trying to drop your first hot single. Like, <laughs> I'm, you know, like, I'm just thinking you want me to pivot. 
right? So I was just like, you know, Lord, I just give up. I throw in the towel. And I told Sylvia the same thing. I was like, I'm giving myself a year. And then after that, like, I'm just going to move back to DC and be a mommy blogger and have some kids or whatever. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I'm ready for like, after the pandemic, I'm ready to settle in. I don't want to fight for parking or anything. I just want to settle into a good old DMV lifestyle eventually. Yeah. And so I told her that and she was like, all right, crazy, like whatever. So literally I get back to New York. I'm just, you know, I'm a freelance journalist. So, you know, projects come as they come and, you know, whatever. And then I got a call from my old editor at Essence and she's like um, a text and she's like, are you in town in New York in ne- uh, this Monday? And this was like Friday. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm in town. What's up? It's like, are you, can you cover the Met Gala? We might have an end to the carpet. And I'm like, I'm sorry, which gala? And like you, you talking about the Met Gala where people have, two and a half months, three months. Pre- people prepare for the Met Gala for four or five months. And you tell them yeah. you want to go cover the carpet on Monday. And she was like, yes. And I was like, okay, well, let me know. So essentially they got the confirmation Friday. I get the story, uh, get get the, the go and no stylists are available because it's not only Met Gala week, it's fashion week and MTV VMAs in the same you week. Yeah, absolutely. No, nobody was available. Thank you, God. My stylist, my hair stylist and my my glam girls, my makeup artists that I use, that I love in New York, Fatima and, and Pierre were available. Thank God. And I got them and I was like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to run a sax. I'm not going to stress. I'm not walking. So like, I don't need to look like Rihanna needs to look. I need to look like how I need to look. So just show me where to go. Try on like 15 dresses found one that fit me right and went on about my business and then got ready for the day. And it was literally like the longest day I ever doing. Like we was out there from you carpet check-in was at five. You had to be there by four 30 or something like that. And the carpet doesn't even open till five 45. So you get an hour and a half to stand, whatever, when you go to like, I'm a carpet like vet. So I know to bring snacks, my charger, water, all that stuff. But I did not know it was going to be like working at retail shift. Like my whole body was hurt because miss, Rianta waited till 10 o'clock to come oh walk the God. carpet. So I'm like, come on, good sis. Half the press done left. Everybody in the, like, people are just over it, right? They're just like, whatever. Yeah. But there were like a few of us who waited. My editor was like, come on, just wait. My videographer was like, I'm about to be out. I'm like, please don't go. So then I got to ask her one question and she's just, I just, you know, we're obsessed with her. But um, it was incredible. It was one of those things I was like, wow, I hope I do get to do it again. But also, if I don't, that was a really long car, but now I had a beautiful time and I got everything I need. <laughs> I needed to get out of it, but it was beautiful and I'm so grateful. And then on the way to the Met Gala, I get a text from Gabrielle Union's like bestie slash manager and uh, was like, hey, can you do a book stop with us um, tomorrow? Meaning like the next day. So, you know, I went to the Met Gala after party, honey. I was outside. I'm not going to miss a good night to like enjoy. I went to the Pierre Moss one. I had a good time looking for him. It was everything. And so I wake up the next morning and I'm like, oh, okay. Like I'm thinking it's at a Barnes and Noble and people are just going to come sit around while Gabrielle Union talks. Right. It ended up being on the stage at King's Theater. It was a ticketed event where everybody, in, like it was wild. And I was like, all right, Lord, you playing games. And so when I posted that, Sylvia DM me and was like, do you see what God is doing? All that talking, all that little nya, 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 nya. And he done showed you. Every single time you say you're going to give up, he moves you to the space. Now, if you could just accept it, please, and go for it, we'll be good. And so ever since, you know, then God has been showing out. I don't even know what this, I, I'm, I'm in all. I'll be like, what? Like, <laughs> all right. So it's, it's, it's wild. And I'm thankful that we serve a God who knows his children, who knows us and loves us deeply, but also who keeps us around people who know and love him deeply and also know and hear our dreams and see our dreams. Because, you know, every now and then you need somebody to be like, girl, you tripping. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You just tripping. God's got you. Yeah. Because, you know, it's so crazy when you, um, you're telling that story. I, I, I understand that feeling like I'm in a hamster, like I've been in this game long enough. There's no reason I should still be hustling like this. It's like, like this, I should still not be hustling like this. I should not be, like you said, looking for parking. I should not be trying to beast to get into this room. I should, I, when you're standing in a space, and I only say that because at a certain point in time in my life, I was a photographer 
and I was trying to get into all the rooms, trying to get all the, you know, all the exclusive pictures. Yeah. And after I did so much work after a while, I was like, I would see Johnny Nunez walk by and I'd be like, I, like, you know, and Johnny still hustles though. Do Johnny not, still hustles. Johnny still hustles. But it got to the place that I was like, yo, oh God, I'm, you know, I'm tired of staying out till 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning, trying to make sure I process these pictures fast enough that they get to the right people and they get published or whatever that looks like. To do all that and then someone like, um, what's the, the website that really gets all the exclusive uh, images? Like the um, shade. Oh, Getty or The Shade? Getty, it's like, their image, like the, whatever images they've gotten already, before you even get home, like you're literally sitting down in front of your computer ready to upload and the exclusive pictures are up. And you're like, God, you want me to hustle like this forever? Forever? Because I saw a tweet that you posted in 2019 and how you said you were ready for that mm -hmm. next level, that next season when God would have you working on with a specific company. And that time is, that time is, is, is here. It's coming mm -hmm. soon because like I'm telling you, being someone who watched I watch. I've watched my my watch that you started with DC with the um the Wizards. Wizards, you know Rodney and um ah. watching you two side by side, and I'm like, yo, who? Right. This is like this is like who is Gia Peppers dot com? This is the because that's the part. I'm like, who? Where did she come from? Like, right. who is she? But after that, I just saw level up, level up, level up. But the crazy part about the journey for the person going through the level up. You don't feel like mm -hmm. you're going through a level up. It feels like a hustle and on hustle on hustle. Yeah. Um, and I think that like one of the questions I have for you is like, under how do you get to the place where you get to understanding what God is doing for you during those times? Like, like instead of mm -hmm. the why me, but then the question is, when did you get to a point where you started saying like, Okay, God, what do you want me to learn in this season? Mm, 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 mm. I, I think it depends on my mental capacity at that time, because some seasons I am like that. Some seasons I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, too much is happening. Let me shut everything down because I must be needing to hear something that I'm not hearing, that must be needing to absorb something that I'm not absorbing. Sometimes right. though, um, I am learning now, especially as I like, I'm, I'm officially bi-coastal. So I am now learning like, oh, okay. My morning time has to be so extremely intentional that like nothing or no one can block it. Like it has to be like one of those things where it's like, okay, so if my first shoot is up at the, of the day, it needs me to be there, there at 9 a.m. Eastern. That means I got to wake up at daggone 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. to get my you know time up uh, time with god before i go um because you know hair glam all that stuff takes so much time but the the god the god centering of the day the intention the intentional prayer time the quiet time is so important to everything i do and so um when i'm not there i know that when i'm not on that pattern and practicing my prayer life my spirituality i know that is me when I can't, when I'm too caught up in comparison or I'm too caught up in what's happening, what's not happening, what's not going my way, I know that it's me. And I have to, and, I, and I'm, I'm challenging myself to say, all right, G, something isn't right spiritually. Let's go. Like my, did, I started therapy uh, during the pandemic, during the quarantine. And she just taught me so much about how to my, mind our thoughts, how to be aware of those thoughts and not judge yourself, not fight yourself on it, not belittle yourself because you are thinking horrible thoughts, but to say, you know what, that's interesting. Where did that come from? Let me unpack it. And when my, and when I start to spiral, cause I am a Virgo. So when I start to spiral and overthink things, I'm like, okay, I have let me, it, it, morning time or evening time, whatever, top of the day, end of the day, I will put on, there's this incredible song called the journal by Casey J and mm. she, she is brilliant. It's like a 10 minute song. And in it, she sings all these things about why she's just not the one. Um, you know, she's just like, God, don't you, she literally says, please don't use me. Mm. You can't use me. And then she said, here comes your word. And she replaces every bad thought in the song with a beautiful verse, a beautiful promise from God. And so I literally have my live verse truth time. 
I write down all of my horrible feelings or whatever feelings that are weighing me down, whatever's in my heart that's that's clearly not of God, that's clearly of the world, of competition, of Instagram, whatever it is. And then I get, take myself out of the ego space and put myself back in the heart and spirit space. And it, and it takes a long time to get there fully, right? Like sometimes right. life situations just get you to the point, have you in a chokehold and you're just like, right. dang. But that means you have to do it twice a day. That means you have to do it more so you can say, you know, this is what is real. And so for me, right. um, I am always trying to, I'm always hungry for the voice of God. And I don't hear it every day. I'm not a person that be like, yo, that's crazy God every day. But when I do hear it, I'm like, heard you. My bad if I did something wrong. Great if I'm doing something right. And um, I take that seriously. So I definitely think it's, it's one of those things where I'm learning. I'm still learning that, right? I think journey is a faith. Uh, faith, <laughs> faith is a journey. And um, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't ever think my faith will be perfect. My challenge to myself now is to be more convicted, is to walk in who God is calling me to be, is to take up my space, the space that he commanded for me and imagine for me when I was in my mother's womb or even before that, you know what I'm saying? So right. like, for me, now that's my challenge to be like, cool. Like we know how to move with these thoughts. We know your human side will try you. Let's make sure that the spirit is stronger and let's make sure that we are more convicted in how I approach life because I don't want to waste days anymore. I've done enough of that. Yeah. And it's the scariest thing knowing that you, you know, we've been in spaces where we wasted days and it's in, in places where like, you know, clear as day, you can hear God say, this, this is not where I'm telling you to go. Mm. But, you know, uh, a lot of us have had to, um, you know, sometimes you got to go through those moments. You got to go through those seasons and you have to sometimes fall on your face. And sometimes falling on your face doesn't actually look like the bad thing. Sometimes it's just a dead end. And it comes, finally, you get to a place you're like, okay, this ain't the way I'm supposed to be going. Yeah. Um, and, and and the hardest part about that, you know, one, one conversation we talk about a lot over here is obedience, right? Mm. Um, obedience, because... We always say, and this is something I say, say, if you were obedient when God first put it on your heart, it won't mm. feel like so much of a sacrifice. Mm. You know what I mean? There are times when God has said something to you and you wanted it your way and you still went that way. And then finally, maybe a year, two later, I mean, it could be even a month, you come back to it. Now you got to do what God told you to do it, but whatever it is, it's a little harder because now Lift you have real. this with you. You know what I'm saying? So what, what was a time that maybe in your career or coming to this space where you are, where you've had to be obedient? And, you know, um, my guy, Avery Wilson always says, we always talk about this. We say obedience is exhausting. Oh what? my God. <laughs> um, I think that God calls us to do that all, all the time. And I think that my stubborn self is always, has always in the past just taken my time to do it. Um, I think the most immediate call that I answered that was a major sacrifice to my tired, just just it, 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 the exhausting thing you're talking about was when I said yes to the Wizards and yes to uh, Hot 97 and Essence all at the same time. And so uh, essentially, you know, this, golly, when did I start with the Wizards? 2014. I don't remember what year. I think it was 2015. This is like three years after I graduated from college. And um, Rodney actually knows a lot of my friends from Rutgers. I went to Rutgers University right. because I did not want to go to St. John's University. It was just too small. I could not do it. It was I, absolutely. I wanted a college experience and I didn't want to go to NYU. NYU is basically the city. I don't, I wanted the college ball games madness. I wanted that. So I went to Rutgers and um. Uh, you know Rodney's from New Jersey so he knows all the Jersey folk and he tweeted like they need a in, a, in arena co-host they need someone new for the Wizards so one of my home girls Wu Ra she texted me and was like look I don't know if you're willing to do this because you've been grinding in New York but like it'd be cool you know I'm a Wizards fan that through and through because my family literally like we grew up in that arena my dad used to work at NPR down the street so we would go after game after school and stuff to games you know do our homework at the job then go there and so I grew up watching Juan Dixon Kwame Brown Michael Jordan like all of the iterations of the Wizards and up until like John Wall and then you know most recently I'm 
we won't talk about we don't got time to get in there. <laughs> but I will say, <laughs> but I will say I sent in my reel. And then when I auditioned, I remember going up the stairs of the 400 section, the the, the same, you know, escalators that had gone up uh, thousands of times being like, wow, God, you got me back here. Like, that is so funny. Yeah. You got me back here. And so when I'm walking up this, this, the steps to the audition, I just felt like immediately God said, this is yours. Like, I heard God say, this is yours. It was yeah. like 10 other girls in the room. And I was like, so not afraid. I don't, I, it was, it had, it was God with me. It was God in me. I did my thing. And then um, what ended up happening was they had preseason auditions and preseason was like five to six it's like five to six weeks and so we would have to come down and audition and we would have to ask people to vote for us we'd have to send it out to all of our community post it on our pages and all that stuff and every single week there was some someone home like america's next time model. and yeah. so um i remember rodney pulling me to the side and saying like yo like you're killing it i think you got it like you know i'm not the front office but like i really am pulling for you and i was like wow that's so crazy you know, you know, I just am, I can't, you know, I, I felt like I was doing really good, but you never know. And um, they had like a good three, two, three weeks where they were just making decisions. They weren't calling anybody back. It was just like silence. And I remember asking God for a sign. And I was like, Lord, you got me looking crazy out here. I done asked all these people in my community to vote for me. They done post, posting on Facebook, Twitter. And so like, everybody's like, yes, she like, I was like, Lord, please don't embarrass me in front of my friends, my mama friends, my cousin. Like, you know, I was like the only one from DC that was black. And I was like, Lord, come on. Like, it's me. Like, who else is going to be for real? Right. And I was like, okay, Lord, just give me a sign. I really appreciate it. So I was working at this startup while, right before I got the job with Essence called N Stars, which is not a... I'm pretty sure it was a front for some. I don't even think it was real. But at the time I was walking down in Battery Park, it was in Financial District. And I was praying in that sign space. And I'm literally walking down the street and I see Rodney literally walking up the street. And I'm like, say, bro, who, <laughs> how? So I walk up to him and he's like, Gia, Gia, I'm telling you now, I think you got it. I promise you, you think you got it. You got to do this. Da, da, da. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like, look at God in his size. I was just freaking out. So then that night, um, I think it was that night, it, later in that was something like that. It was Power, the Power Show at Power 105 yeah. major, you know, it was yeah. when Jay-Z was performing. Okay, yeah, I remember that night. When Jay-Z was performing and like Beyonce was backstage, everybody's backstage, it was like a thing. And so somehow I got backstage because one of my friends, Brittany O'Garrow, I love her so much. She let me backstage to come with her and her artist. And essentially Beyonce walks by me. And I'm just like, I love you so much. I just want you to know you're the best thing that's ever happened to this world. And she's like, thanks, gives me a hug and keeps it moving. And um, when I was leaving the carpet, I got the call from the front office. And they were like, hey, we would love for you to be our in arena host for the Washington Wizards 2014, 2015 season. The only thing is you have to get rid of your bangs. I was wearing bangs at the time. and It was cutting off my, um, my face on the yeah. jumbotron. And I had been so afraid to show my forehead my in almost... It was through high school and in high school, I started wearing bangs because I had friends. Jonan is a big, you know, culture in DC. Jonan yeah. is essentially playing the dozens, like going off, you know, like playing, joking on somebody. Yeah, and so, yeah, everybody was making fun of me because of my forehead. So I eventually got bangs and I had to stop wearing them. But I took that job that day and then I got the job with Ebro working at High 97 and working at Essence as the Essence Fest associate editor. And I remember mm -hmm. saying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to be able to make this work, but if you want me to make this work, if I'm supposed to juggle all three, I will do it. And mm. so essentially for three seasons, three and a half, four seasons, I was juggling, or sorry, three seasons out for two seasons. I was juggling all of them because in between I started working at different places, but for two seasons, what I would do is, cause I didn't start working at BT with Rodney at the same time. So we were on trains together. It was crazy. Um, so what, then what I would do was wake up and go to like in an offense, either Ebro uh, in the morning show. I was the, uh, the host, not the host, Jesus. I was the editor of his website called blamewebro.com. So yeah. I would go in, talk to him for the morning show. And then I was also the associate editor of essencefest.com. So mm. depending on the time of day that I was needed, I would go into either Hot 97 or Essence. I would be there by 8 a.m., work the morning from 8 to like 11.45, hop on the train or take a cab if I was close enough to Penn Station, get a, a 12.30 bus 
or train, get to the arena by four, 4.30, take the, ne the next train to the arena, then take, uh, then get to my dressing room, change, do all that cute stuff, do my makeup and hair, get ready for the pre-show meeting, eat before the pre-show meeting, start hosting the pre-show from 6.15 to 9.30. Mom, who's a basketball stan, like literally, no, she is NBA headquarters. She knows all things basketball. She would get me from the game either because she was there or right outside. We would drive back home. Dad would wake me up at 4.20 every single morning. I'll be back in New York by 8.30 a.m. the next day, like nothing ever happened. And so I did that for like two and a half, three years. I was with the Wizards, I think for four seasons, but, at, but again, there was some overlap. And I proved to myself that I could do it. Right. Now, in the midst of that, that looks, I am a love, hopeful, romantic. I love love. I love relationships. I love all of that stuff. But I think it's been my biggest sacrifice is like, I am a person that like, loves love but you also need to stay in one place to truly fall in love with somebody or at least be somewhat stable and right. I know God must be raising up a king who can handle my crazy schedule because I don't plan for it to be this crazy forever but I know that in these next two years I gotta go hard but I yeah. don't want to sacrifice love anymore and that has been my biggest sacrifice like singleness mm -hmm. has been my biggest sacrifice because I don't just hop into bed with everybody. I'm not really like out here just busting it wide. Like, I'm just not that girl. I yeah. give off homegirl energy per at, per the streets. And so like, you know, I don't really do the whole, I'm not really good at, at dating, but I want to get better. But yeah, I would say that's been my biggest sacrifice and still being obedient at this point to the call. Like, all right, Lord, I got to do LA. I know that you're calling me to do LA. I do not want to be so far away from my family. Anyone who knows me knows I love my family. Like, I was looking for houses in DC towards the end of the pandemic. And something said, God was like, go to LA. I need you to go to LA. I need you to figure it out. Sacrificing family time, friends time, and love is the biggest sacrifice. And so that's one of the things I'm learning. I'm asking God for discernment around right now. It's like, how do I make room for yeah. love in my life when you got me calling? You calling me to all these daggone places and all the mans is like, dang, she must not be trying to date. Or they just assume I have a boyfriend somewhere because so many girls in my line of work hide men, which I get. They not hiding their world from the, from the men. They hide their man from the world. I get it. But like at the end of the day, I'm not her. So, you know, that, I feel like that's been my, <laughs> my biggest sacrifice for sure. Yo, that's, 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 um, and that's encouragement to, um, I think a lot of women that feel like, their lives are on a timeline you know they're yeah. thinking, and it's like you know and i think a lot of times people need to remember the god they serve you know what i'm saying like you know god will not hold any good thing from you you know what i'm saying yeah. so in that time of singleness um a lot of women spend more time complaining about you know dealing with this singleness instead of saying what can I do in this time to make sure that if this person shows up today, you know, I'm ready. You know, I, I've done all the work because a lot of people have not taken the time to do the work necessary during their single season. What are some things that you feel like you were able to cultivate in that time um, that's going to prepare you for that next level of marriage? Mm, Lord Jesus, I would definitely say my emotional work. Um, healing a lot of the, like, it's not that I don't have, I haven't had relationships, but, you know, healing that trauma. So I'm not carrying the heartbreak from other relationships is super important to me. I want my heart to be as present as possible with this human being. And there are patterns and stuff that like, only you will get to find out in relationships because people become your mirrors and they're like, well, wait, you do that and you're crazy. But I've learned to say, you know, okay, call it out, not to be like angry with it, but to be, to listen when it's necessary. Because I also think on the flip side of that, well, while women are doing the work, I don't find a lot of men doing the work either. And so I also think we get to this space where it's like, you come to this relationship, you've done all this work and you love this man, but he doesn't know how to communicate because he just doesn't believe in communicate. Like he's just like, I said what I said and that's that, right? right. And I think communication and honesty are so important, but also, there's a, a, I think a major, like a major reality check that we all have to have in loving ourselves so much first 
that <laughs> meeting somebody is only going to add to the self love and only going to make the love that you two share better. And I think um, that's one of the things I've been cultivating is like self love, like for everything in every time I still got my quarantine 15 and I love myself. And I'm like, you know what, girl, one day you won't feel like losing that weight. And one day when you do, I'm gonna be so proud of you. But for now you're beautiful and stunning and I'm proud of you. Like usually the old me would be all self-conscious. Now I'm like, dog, hey, look, it was a traumatic year. And a lot of the times a sis was doing horribly with the diet, but I made it through. Okay. So I had to do what I had to do. And I'm not, and I don't want to shame anybody like for any way that they process. And I think that's what I've learned. Um, if anything is how to love myself so that I can love others better, learn how to pour into my own cup so I can pour into others better. Um, learn how to pray for my husband, husband, wherever he is. One of my mentors, big sisters, love of my lives, Jovi and Zane. I remember having her, that same conversation with her about a year and a half ago. I was on the on a, on a drive from New York to DC and I do a lot of good praying on my drive. So like I was on a drive and um, I was just like, sis, I'm so sick of like being single. I'm over it. I'm over going to stuff by myself. I'm over like fake faking um, with guys that are like kind of cool. And I don't even know, like, I don't want that. Like, who's sure who pulls up. It is what it is. It's nothing else. Right. And so right. she, you know, I was you, she's married now with a child. And she was like, I was you like three years ago, but she was like, you know what I started doing? I started praying for my husband. Mm. I don't know who he is, but I know that God is preparing him. And she was like, I, I start, I would start praying and just say, God, I don't know where my husband is, but I hope that you are giving him what he needs to get through this day. I hope that he is fine, fine, wherever he is. I hope that he's safe and protected. I hope that his family is well. I hope he knows he is loved. I hope he right. knows that there is someone there who's being raised up for him to love him correctly. And I was like, well, that's, that's okay. I'm going to have to remember to do that because that's beautiful. <laughs> You know, like that's so dope. And so now I've also learned to to think of him, even though I don't know him. I don't know if I know him. I don't know if I've seen his face yet, but I just know that God does have him for me. And so I, you know, I don't do it every day, but every now and then I'd be like, all right, when I'm sick of it, the singleness, I'm like, let me pray for my man because he's going to be here soon enough getting on my nerves and I'm going to be mad that I wasn't, that I'm not single no more. So let me, <laughs> so let me be quiet and pray for him. <laughs> No, that's that's the, you know that's good stuff because you know I'm I'm around people and I'm around friends and I know for a fact you know the crazy part especially if you're not really um, in tune with your prayers and your faith there's a lot of women that just don't know how to be by themselves during those single seasons during those seasons where they can cultivate and do the work and self love instead you know they tend to um, what's the word? I would say, I'm not going to say lollygag, but they tend to find ways to numb that, to, to substitute that solitude, find ways to include other people in that journey. And sometimes that means just very lolly, I mean, random dating, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And, you know, what we're not realizing in that process is, you know, a lot of that does, you know, a lot of that now does um, involve um sex you know what i'm saying and a lot of people don't understand what sex just randomly having sex with people um can do to them like you know it's a, it, it is a soul tie of some sort you know what i'm saying and um i think that you know it, it's good to hear that like you know what i'm saying to understand what that means for the average woman you know who's trying to figure out what's next for them you know especially when they're single because yeah. Yeah. And I just, again, flipping that back on the men, because now look, it's a lot of Christian men out here doing the same exact thing now. So it's like, we, right. have to, we got to remember that it's not always on the woman either. It's, it's, it's like, we all have so much to give to the space of love. And, and, um, you know, I don't judge any, like there is so much, uh, confusion, in life around how to date as a Christian woman, a Christian man, how to like approach the conversation of sex, celibacy, virgin, being a virgin, all of that. I'm not, I don't judge. I'm just like, is your soul in the right space? And can you, you handle that type of life? Like it does change you. I don't know. My friend uh, and, and my good the theologian sis, doctor, scholar, I love following Candace Bembo because she just 
burst so many bubbles of like just old church theologies and stuff like that. And she actually doesn't believe in soul ties. And I want to sit down and talk to her about that because like, the, I just love to hear people's perspectives on faith because there's a lot of space. There's a lot of things that are said in the Bible. Yeah. There's a lot of space for interpretation. And sometimes I think, you know, we run with certain narratives from old church that don't necessarily work in today's life. Right. And then there are some that absolutely, you know, I believe in and hold full, full, full heartedly to, but I, I would want to have that conversation with her. But yeah, like, I think that it's one of those things where um, it's, it's like, you got to find who loves you and where you find love and you got to figure out like where your spirit shines and thrives because if it's not in some people like I I'm also in that balance like how do you know who you like if you don't go date like you can't just he ain't about to pull up on your doorstep hopefully not I mean it's scary times I hear people really do be out here but like I don't want you to I don't want to see you on my block I want to I want to meet you somewhere you know, in a nice space and get to know if I like you that way. But, you know, dating doesn't always have to include sex and, you know, doing all that other stuff doesn't always have to be physical first. So I think it's just, you know, on people's approach, their day to day. But for me, yeah, I would love, I would love to, to, you know, cultivate a real true long lasting relationship where it's like, okay, this is my person. I want to see and experience God's tangible love for me on earth through this man, whoever he is, and hopefully, right. you know, that I'll, I'll do the same for him. And the amazing thing is just, you know, watching your journey, somebody who follows you on social media is looking and seeing you come from that. Oh, that's you, another you, reason why it's you, hard. Cause I'd be like, dang, you ain't, my, you ain't, you ain't about to turn up like my dad. Like you going to do that like my dad. It ain't, it's, it's old school marriage. Now my mom, now I, I, as a grown woman, I'm like, okay, marriage is hard now I'm not rushing to it because it is right. hard it's a daily choice to choose someone else to choose their needs and their wants and right. being there for your family it's a, it's an unselfish thing love isn't selfish love is kind we all know it's not loud or boastful right. it's 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 it's, it's, it's all of the incredible things that that are real and all the hard hard things that are painful right and so right. um I, I do my parents have been together for 32 years and married, right. married for 32 years and together, I think 35. And so, you know, I've seen the ups and downs and the ins and outs, ins and outs of their relationship. And, you know, I, I know it's not, it's not easy, but man, I can't wait to, to have a husband who gets on my nerves. And I'm probably going to be, <laughs> a, I know all my friends who are listening or the old, the folks who are married are like, yeah, all right. But when you've been single, you kind of wait. <laughs> no, because I've seen, I, like I said, I love, I, I used to watch you, uh, you post your father, you used to post, and, and how important was it for you? Like, um, you know, how important has your father's presence, present in your life, um, affected who you are as a woman? Today? What? I don't, I would not be who I am without Gregory Peppers. I would not be who I am without Gail Peppers there. They're, they are my saving grace. They are my safe place. They are my, the light in this world. They are the four angels that God put on earth. The, the four, including my brother and sister, Gretchen and Gavin, um, put on earth for me to love and them to love me. They, they are everything. My dad is a journalist. Um, so I would not have been a journalist had I not seen up close and personal what that lifestyle was like. Um, yeah. having someone to call, we are born five days apart, many years, but five yeah. days apart in the same month. So like, you know, I think a lot like him, um, very sensitive, like my dad, my dad doesn't, my dad's male, you know, masculinity shows up and how he reacts to his sensitivity. But when it comes to like our relationship, you know, he's dad, he's my best friend, one of my best friends in the world. I can call him for anything. And, and, um, he, he often has asked me, like, I haven't made the best choices in dating men. And he's often asked me, like, didn't I, didn't I show you different? Do you think you deserve that? <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. Like, it's kind of a slap. Like, like, I stopped after a while, like, after them dumb 25s to 26s or whatever, that, that, that time, early 20s, till kind of some people late. After a while, I was like, oh, this is really a slap in the face of my dad. Like, right. he didn't show up in and out every single day for me to act like I don't know what love looks Look, like from a man. Yeah. So 
um, yeah, he's everything and he's a hard act to live up to. So. <laughs> nah, that's, that's good. And, you know, eventually I do, I hope and pray when um, ever that time comes along, you know, I, I've seen so many healthy relationships. I, I'm like, you know, I, I want to show up as that dad, you know what I'm saying? You know, not just as a, I grew up in a Nigerian household, so my father was a disciplinarian. So yeah. <laughs> it was a little different, but I've got an opportunity to see so many different versions of fatherhood. Um, I can't, I can't wait for that. Um, yeah. it, it's so bomb. Um, wow. I had so many questions for you, but, um, so let me, but cause I, cause of time, cause it, we, I know, uh, we both have, uh, runs today. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'll come nah, back for part two. Remember your question. Nah, I'll come back for part two. <laughs> um, my, my, one question to you is um, if you could give advice to young women that are um, looking to get into the industry, they're looking to get into media, what is something that you would advise them today? Mm. I would say if you are looking to get into media and entertainment, journalism and journalism in, in front of the camera, especially um, know your voice and honor your voice, honor what you want to say, what you want to represent. Um, there is a fine line uh, that is often blurred between journalism and influencing that I think um, has to you know, be a real conversation eventually. Sometimes I am you know, acting as a journalist and sometimes I'm acting as a personality on air talent and influencer. And I've had to learn how to very much decipher which opportunity demands what. So, you know, like if I'm, luckily I'm not a, a critic, but a lot of the times in, in journalism school and ethics class, they'll teach you, you know, you can't take gifts from people. Now we had a space and time where people send out gifts all the time. Right. And so, you know, uh, and you can share it or not, you can cover it or not. Um, but I've also been very fortunate to never work for a, you know, company full-time just yet that demands their talent to like, not post anything or like, I'm not a New York Times writer or Washington Post critic, so I don't have to do that. Um, but I would definitely say study the craft, know what you want to say, have your why at the beginning. Always try to write down something, even if it's in your notes, that is a game plan to what it is that you want to accomplish when you are at a space where you feel like you have the power to do so. Because what happens so many times is from your day one, you finally graduate from college, your, your, your eyes are bright, you're starry eyed, everything in the future is ahead of you. And what happens is you write down these plans and these goals and somewhere along the way, things start to chip away at what you wanted to do and be. Eventually you start seeing, oh, this works. The girls are getting likes if they do this. So I'm gonna right. start doing that. Oh, right. this is how people react to that? Dang, I'm gonna start doing that. Little by little, things change and morph so much so that at the end, by the time you get to that area where you have the space to do what you dreamed of in the beginning, you don't even remember your dreams. So mm -hmm. I always tell people to like really write down what it is that like made you start. What, what did you want to fill in that gap that you feel like you represented? So you, you know, will always have your focus ahead of you because it's so easy to get caught up. This lifestyle, this game, all of it is just that a game, an industry, you have to be so mindful of your voice, God's voice, your purpose, God's purpose for you, that you don't get caught up in all of it. And even if you do get caught up in all of it, because I've gotten caught up, not crazily, but like, you know, definitely had some no's that kind of shattered my confidence, shattered who I, I, I thought God needed me to be in that moment and made me question everything really. And even if you have to do that extra work to come back, just always know that there is a center for you to come back to. There is a God that is waiting for you at all times, who is ready to hear you, who is ready to love you, who is ready to, to remind you of who he is and who you are and how he fearfully and wonderfully made you before you even got in your mother's womb, he had a plan for you, right? And so you got to remember that. If you can remember your why, your reason, everything else will come but just try to remember like what makes you, you, everyone's gonna, this is a saturated game. Everybody is a, a rapper, singer, dancer, artist, host, clothing designer, hair braided. Like everybody does <laughs> everything. If you are looking to do a job that no one has ever done at this point, it might not happen, but no one has your exact 
perspective or experience and in your sphere of influence you don't know the even if 100 people follow you someone in your sphere of influence is looking up to you at you you are inspiring somebody to do something so if you don't get to your dream they will never get to theirs it's so much bigger than all of it all of the right. the, the instagrams and whatever it's like what are you here to do do that and yeah. try to do it at your best yeah yeah no that's good um and, and and lastly um last question is how um important is god how important is god to anyone who's in the industry how important is it for for us to have god in the center of everything we do let me tell y'all something i do not know how people do the industry without god because i would let every single no deter me. I would let every single wrong interaction deter me. If I did not know God for myself, I don't know how I would have survived this industry. Um, God is at the center of everything I do because he is the one who made me. So ain't no center without God. Ain't no nothing. I don't do anything without him. And so um, he's the important, he is the alpha and omega, the beginning, the end, and the writer of my story. So when I say I trust God completely and fully, that looks like me going to LA, even though I can't. I don't love LA, but I do know that the opportunities <laughs> out there are really awesome. And I am starting to be open to the idea of just allowing myself to love it for the for the moment or however long I'm going to be there. Like, I do think um, that there is no, there is no way I could approach this opportunity, these opportunities without God. I don't have an agent. I don't have, you know, crazy booking people who are reaching out on my behalf all the time. 85% of the stuff I have done has been because of uh, my work relationships. I've worked hard or people speaking up my name. And that's right. how I know that God is real because right. it could be people I never even met. And they just like, yo, I love that one thing you did. They're in the meeting at a major brand and they want to work with me and they put my face on the deck. And then do you know how many other people have to be said no to for me to get that? So when I tell people like, what's for you is for you. What's for you is God will never, ever, 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 ever give you something that is not supposed to be for you. And so I think it's so important um, to, to just be mindful of his presence as all, at all times. He's the guiding light in the ship, in the, in the, in the troubled waters, he's there. And I think um, that is my, my saving grace in my life, but especially in this industry. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I, I thank you for, first of all, coming on here, your time. I love what you're doing. I want you to keep being a light in what you, in the industry, you're a light. If you don't realize it, if you don't know it, you're a light to so many people in so many different avenues. Um, I have a quick, rapid five questions for you. Let's um, do it. <laughs> so the first one I have for you right now, not let's braids or faux locks. What's that? Not let's braids or faux locks. Braids, all day, every day braids. Brooklyn or DC? DC, sorry, Brooklyn, I love you. <laughs> Favorite Bible verse? Ooh, how much time you got? But Romans eight twenty eight this year. Um, uh, for we all, for we know all the things that all, all things work together for the good of those who love and are called according to His plans, purposes. That's my favorite one. Mm. Yeah, favorite year. favorite song of the year. Very essence. Very. Oh my God! Well, I knew it. I didn't want to say that. I was about to say accept that, but that's good. That's good. That's, it's that's such good. a good song. It's such a, such a beautiful song. It's such a beautiful song. Um, and lastly, um, oh, number five is blank, but no, it's easy. This is a this is an easy one for me. Uh, certified lover boy or Donda. LB, I love me some. <laughs> Some Drizzy Drake, and I, I love Kanye too, but CLB. Thank you. Thank you, G. I appreciate you today. Um, and that's another episode of the Unconventional Christian Podcast. Thank, Thank you for you. having me.